means? A lot of people don't enjoy living in reality. A lot of times when we take a vacation, go on a few days away, enjoy the serenity and the, of just nothing. <laughs> Sometimes we'll make the statement in a negative phrase, well, tomorrow is back to reality. You see, reality is real. <laughs> it's not make-believe. Now, a lot of people like living in fairy tale land. Oh, you can be whatever you want to be, wherever you want to be it. But see, that's not reality. Reality is the state of things as they actually exist, as opposed to idealistic or notional ideas. The state of being real. Mm -hmm. Reality consists of facts. Mm -hmm. What's real? Mm -hmm. So many people have their an idealistic or notional idea of things comes becomes to be so prevalent in their life they lose sight of what reality really is. Right? How many has ever heard the phrase reality check? Sometimes, you know, we might say to someone else, yeah, they, they need a reality check. Sometimes we need a reality check. A reality check is something has made someone recognize the truth about a situation. A reality check. Something has happened in your life that has caused you to, be, to realize or recognize the truth about a situation. To recognize the difficulties involved in something they want to achieve. We all need to come to reality in the Lord. Amen? Our ideas... Our idealistic and notional ideas, they are exact opposite of reality in most cases. We need a reality check to what is real in serving the Lord. Yes. John's revelation was in all of reality. We need to understand that. People read the Word of God and they focus on mysteries and, you know, just can't understand symbols. And Well, listen, the, the Word of God is written in reality. Yes, we need the Spirit of God to help us understand it, but it's written in reality. There are three parts to the revelation that John received. Things that were, things that are, and things yet to come. But I want you to understand as John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and he was carried away in the Spirit and in this vision that the Lord brought unto him, as he saw the things that were past, the things that were present, and the things to come, he saw them in the present tense immediately right now is where John stood and all that he saw that was going on it was reality to him as the spirit of the Lord moved upon him and he wrote the prophecy he wrote it in the present tense of what's happening right now in chapter 19 of the book of revelations the Lord reveals some things to John yet to come. But John saw them in the present tense. 
in all reality. What he saw was real. It wasn't make-believe. He, you know, he wasn't writing us some things that, that, that had evolved from his idealistic and notional ideas of what God was trying to say to him. No, it was real. Revelations 19 and 7. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb. I want to stop right there for just a minute. John saw the marriage of the Lamb and it was real. It was reality. We've heard about it. We've read about it. We've, the message has been preached to us. Books have been written about it. Songs have been sung about it. We make reference to it all the time, the marriage of the Lamb. But John stood in the Spirit on the Lord's day and the prophecy revealed unto him and he saw the marriage of the Lamb in all reality as it was taking place before his very eyes. He says, for the marriage of the Lamb may come one day. Mm -mm. The marriage of the Lamb, we hope, if nothing, if all stars line up, will come to pass someday. Is that what your Bible says? No. Let us be glad and rejoice and give thanks to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. It is come. John saw it right now in all reality of everything that was going on around him. He was eyewitness to the marriage of the Lamb. And he said, and his wife. How many believes in the bride of Christ? Sure. Covenant members were part of it, right? John saw her. He says, and his wife. He was looking way ahead in time. The Lord carried him in a vision to right then in that perfect tense of what was happening, he saw this taking place. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife, now listen to this, hath made herself ready. This word hath means it had already taken place. Hath made herself ready. I want to, I, want, I hope this message can sink into you like it sunk into me. John saw the bride of Christ. Amen? You believe that? Not in a state that she was trying to get herself ready. But he saw her in the state when she hath made herself ready. I want to speak to us this morning about being ready. We got somewhere to get to before we're ready. But I want us to understand, in all reality, John saw her when she had made herself ready. The original Greek word translated here for ready, I want us, ready can be an adjective or a verb. An adjective, what does an adjective do? Describes something. An adjective describes a noun. An adjective described the bride of Christ one day. When John saw her, he saw her and said, she's made herself ready. The adjective was able, means she was able to respond without delay or hesitation. This is what it means to be ready. Able to respond without delay or hesitation. 
It also means in a suitable state for a particular activity. How many is ready to run a marathon today? I don't believe nobody in this building as I look around. Not ready, are we? But John saw the marriage of the Lamb and his wife, and he saw she had made herself ready for that ceremony that was taking place. She was there, and she was ready. The verb ready means, now this verb shows action. It means to make necessary preparation. She was there. She had made necessary preparation to be there. This day did not sneak up on her or take her by surprise. We talk about the marriage of the Lamb and we look way ahead in time, way down the road, that someday the glorious church of God is going to be perfected and she's going to be presented to the bridegroom. He's going to present her to himself. We look a hundred years or a thousand years or a million years down the road that this is going to take place. Well, listen, John saw her and she had already made preparation, the necessary preparation that she fit the criteria of being ready. Yes, she will be ready. Thank the Lord. We must make necessary preparations for the rapture. Do we still believe in the rapture? The Lord is soon returning, and only those who have made themselves ready will go. We must make necessary preparations for the rapture and the marriage of the Lamb before we will be identified as those who have made ourselves ready, we must first make ourselves ready. <laughs> right? We must first make ourselves ready. Now, don't be confused. She's going to be ready. John saw her. She has already made herself ready. But what about you and I? Will we be part of her? Before we are, we will have made the necessary preparations to make ourselves ready. Look with me in Matthew chapter 25. We have the account here of the ten virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now I want us to understand right here, there had been some preparation, right? What kind of preparation was made? Well, they all took their lamps. Some preparation is not enough. They took their lamps. They went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and what? And took no oil with them. Hmm. They failed to be prepared. Oh, they started out carrying their lamps just like the five wise, but they took no oil with them. But the wise took oil. You see the total dis difference here. What made five of them wise and five foolish? The five wise were fully prepared. They had made the necessary preparation. The five foolish were just halfway prepared. Oh, but they were going right along with them, weren't they? But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lambs. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. How, how many has been in this way five years? How many has been 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? <laughs> huh? Some of you can just hold your hand up till I get tired of talking to you. 
But it says here, the bridegroom tarried. But listen, those who were wise, now it says they all slumbered and slept, but those who were wise, they made sure they maintained their oil. No matter how long the bridegroom tarried, they had made the necessary preparations and they were maintaining. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. All of them. They rose and they rolled the wick up. I guess is how they done it in those days. One of them had a big lighter. and Well, you are awake, ain't you? And they lit their lanterns, their lamps. All of them. But there was only half of them who had oil in their lamps. Oh, isn't that, oh, isn't that scary? That we would be running right along with those who are fully prepared, thinking we're prepared, but yet all we've got is a lamp, an empty lamp. Everyone else jumps up and trims their lamps. We trim in ours, but there's no oil. But John saw the wife that has made herself ready. We got some getting ready to do. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were, what? And they that were, what? And they that were, well, say it with me. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Now, John saw the wife that hath made herself ready. Listen, being ready is going to separate us from everybody else who's not ready. They were foolish. Five of them were foolish. They were foolish in thinking that hobnobbing... <laughs> you know what hobnobbing means? Look it up. It's a real word. They thought... They were hobnobbing with them who were ready that it would qualify them to be ready. Not so. They were foolish in thinking that. But verse 10 says, they that were ready. Oh, it's important to be ready. We can't afford to be so foolish in thinking half preparation will qualify us to be ready for the return of the Lord. Not to mention to be part of the bride of Christ. In Luke 19 and 13, we have the, the parable of the pounds that the man had left and left his servants, left them 10 pounds. And verse 13 says, And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, Somebody say this word with me. Occupy. Let's read it again. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. What does it mean to occupy? It means carry on business. It means to busy oneself about the proper business. You see, he left, and he left some things in their care. Then he says, occupy. Occupy. Carry on the business. You can read the rest of that. I'm not going to read the whole parable there. But let me tell you a, a real life story that I'm very familiar with. I had a good friend years ago. He was 16 years old. 
His father owned a business, and it had grown to a pretty successful little business. And the young boy, he enjoyed bragging about his father's business. He enjoyed reaping from his father's business. He enjoyed the glamour and the spotlight of his father's business. One day his father had some affairs to tend to and he told his son, I need you to get up in the morning and I need you to open shop and take care of business while I'm away tomorrow. Okay, Dad. His dad got up early the next morning and left to be about his affairs and his son laid in the bed. After a little while, his dad came home and his son was still in the bed. (laughs) Sixteen years old and his dad had to drag him out of bed and whip him and make him go open shop. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Pretty sad. He had the wrong attitude about his father's business. Here, the word says, occupy till I come. We've got some responsibility on us to be ready for the Lord's return. We need the right attitude. We must have the right attitude. We must find the right attitude toward the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. If you'll look there with me. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophecies, prophesyings. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And listen, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blameless. We need to have the right attitude towards the Lord's return. Paul's instructing us here to to be blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be blameless. We need need to have the right attitude. We, we, We need to face reality in what is required of us to be part of the bride of Christ. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and 14 that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. We better find the right attitude. We we better come to grips with reality on what the Lord expects out of us. Making ourselves ready includes blameless living and unconditional obedience. (laughs) Blameless living and unconditional obedience until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This sounds like Almost something impossible to do, right? John saw his wife that hath made herself ready. In order to be ready, there is first a lot of spiritual preparations. The first step in being ready is to abandon sin. Hmm. This sounds so elementary, doesn't it? You know, some people, they have their own little notional ideas that being ready, you can still be ready with sin in your life. Some people are under, have little notional ideas that as a little child, if you confess Christ as your Savior, you can live any way you want to live the rest of your life and still be ready. 
That's wrong. We need to come to reality. There was a time when the ark of the Lord had been taken from Israel. You find this in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And the Bible says it had been gone a long time. Twenty years the ark had been gone. And the Bible says they lamented after the Lord. They were so hurt. They were so discouraged. They were so down and out because the ark had been taken. Twenty years it had been gone. But listen to what Samuel says to God's people. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts. Hello? Do do we still realize it's going to take all of our heart? If you do return unto the Lord with all your heart, put away the strange gods. Listen, the very first thing we're going to have to do is put away sin in our lives. Put away the strange gods and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve Him only. Prepare your hearts. Put away sin. In other words, He was saying... Make yourselves ready. We got some getting ready to do, church. There, there, there is the bride of Christ. And John saw her in the present tense at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That had made herself ready, but you and I hadn't made it yet. I want to be part of her, don't you? I want to share a thought with you this morning. Part of this come into reality that we need to realize you are called to godliness. Amen. Many have idealistic and notional ideas that they will be part of the bride based on a profession of some calling. While failing to heed the call to godliness, this is not Reality. Only those who have made themselves ready. And you're called to godliness. A lot of people put a lot of emphasis on other callings. They, they like professing other callings. God, yeah, God called me. And if we're not careful, we'll support other people by saying they... They have a calling on their life. They have a calling on their life. They have, I believe he may have a calling on, she may have a calling on. Listen, the first calling you have is to godliness. Huh? Don't get carried away with every other kind of calling. Huh? I believe I have a calling on my life. I believe many of you have callings on your lives. Whether it be to preach, to teach. To pray. There are all kinds of positions and, and callings. But listen, you're called first to godliness. We miss that calling, you might as well give up on the rest of them. You're called first to godliness. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, Verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained, read this with me, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. Like precious faith. Now, this is something here. We, we need to realize here the Apostle Peter is speaking to you and I who have obtained like precious faith with us, he says. In other words, the very same faith that Peter had obtained, you, you and I can obtain that also. Isn't that, isn't that special? Like to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. This like precious faith produces the same 
precious effects in our lives that it produced in Peter's life. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, we want the same faith, but how about the effects? Oh, it will produce the same precious effects in our life that it produced in Peter's life. It purifies the heart of one the same as the other. Right? Sure. The same precious promises are given to one as to the other. You believe that? This faith takes hold on the same precious Savior as the other, as Peter. Is that operating in your life? Oh. (laughs) To them that have obtained like precious faith with us, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, listen, that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, Peter was so kind to put us into the same category with himself, wasn't he? Huh? He says, all, all of you who've obtained like precious faith, then he says, according as his divine power hath given unto us, Peter and me and you have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. It's just hard for me to live godly. Are you saved? Well, first you need to be saved. But then it's the same precious faith that was living in Peter that will lead you in all areas of life and godliness in your life. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. We got some getting ready to do. We we need to come to reality of what is expected out of you and I to be part of those that have made themselves ready. The Lord has given you the same thing Peter had to help him make it. We can make it. Yes, you are called to godliness. In 1 Timothy 2, Paul charges Timothy to war a good warfare. Then it exhorts him in some things. You'll find this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says, first of all. (laughs) First of all. Then he says some things, but included in that first of all, I'll let you read it and study it out there if you want to. But included there in the first of all is godliness. Without godliness in our lives, we're not going to make it. We're not going to be ready We won't be a part of the bride that John saw that hath made herself ready. Without godliness in your life, you won't make it. Then he goes on and says, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God. In other words, this is what's required. In other words, this is what it's going to take. Godliness in your life. Titus 2 and 12 tells us we should live godly in this present world. Now, just as those that John saw that hath made themselves ready, you know where they were living when they made themselves ready? They were living in this world right here. 
They were facing the same world, if not worse, than what you and I face every day. But yet, they made themselves ready. In 2 Timothy 3 and 5, Paul warns of, of those who would have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What does this mean? What's he really saying about these people? They had religion without the spirit. <laughs> they had a form of godliness. They, they, they realized you know, some people are on to something. They've got God in their life. They live in godly lives. We're going to have to look like we're living godly lives. Paul warns us of these. They were heeding the form instead of the call. To godliness. Listen, you can have a form of godliness. You can look the part, act the part, talk the part, walk the part. The minister there in the assembly a few years ago in his message, I can't remember his, what was your pastor's name, sister? He preached a message and he said, You walk walks and you talk talks but you talk waltz louder than you walk waltz. You can walk the part, talk the part, look the part, right? But Paul warns us of those who had a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. In other words, the Spirit of the Lord was not in them. That's what's going to perfect us. Then Paul goes on and says, from such, turn away. You don't want to be in that crowd because they're not going to make it. You're going to be godly or ungodly. Nowhere in between. Another thought I want to share with us, don't be caught unready. Can I tell you a little story about myself being caught unready? <laughs> When I was a kid, I played Little League baseball. I was an all-star in all of it. I barely made the team, but I loved playing. I enjoyed playing. And after a lot of practice, I got to where I was just decent enough to be on the team. But I was out in the outfield playing left field one day. And I felt fairly confident about what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> but me and one of the other boys in center field, we got to clowning and talking, and I got to paying attention to him. And somehow I got turned around all the way like this. And all of a sudden, I heard a ball hit. And I said, by the time I turned around, that ball said, bam, right in the top of my head. I looked like the biggest fool. Everybody was laughing. Hit me right in the top of the head. All I had to do was, and I'd have had it. But I was caught unready. Isn't that funny? Oh, that's hilarious, isn't it? I laugh every time I think about it. Don't be caught unready on Judgment Day. Don't be caught unready when the Lord splits the eastern skies. It won't be funny. Ecclesiastes 9 and 12. Listen to what the Word of God says. For man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. We're talking about being caught unready. Huh? Listen. John saw a bride that hath made herself ready. She took the necessary preparations, the necessary precautions, the necessary measures. All that was required of her, she applied and she held on and made herself ready to be counted in the number. We are called to godliness. It will take preparation 
to make it. So many are trying to make it on fumes. So many are trying to make it running on fumes instead of a full tank. In 1976 in Daytona, there was a stock car race, final lap. There was two people on the same lap, Richard Petty and David Pearson. And they come out of the fourth turn, and before they could cross the finish line, they touched each other, and there was a wreck, and both cars stalled. Richard Petty was driving a Dodge, and he was trying to... Woo, 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 woo. It wouldn't crank. Some think he ran out of gas. I don't know. David Pearson finally got his car cranked and drove it. They thought Petty was going to spin. The wreck he was spinning, they thought he was going to spin across the finish line. He stopped just feet away from the finish line. Listen, we're not going to recklessly make it in. All of his pit crew jumps over the wall. They come out and they begin pushing the car to try to get it across the finish line. Pearson finally got that Ford cranked and just barely drove, barely beat him. Listen, it ain't nobody going to push you into heaven. You're not going to recklessly cross over into glory. Mm -mm. No. People are trying to make it running on fumes. We need our vessels full. We need our vessels full in order to be ready. In 2 Kings chapter 4, I'll share this story and I'll close. Very beautiful story. Second Kings chapter 4. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me. What hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not, hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Then he says, Borrow not a few, but as many as you can get your hand on. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels. And thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. I want us to point out something right here. Oil was very valuable. So Elisha instructs her, instructs her, she has a little pot of oil. Go and borrow the vessels. Not just a few. Now this took effort to go out. But I want, I want us to see here, it says, her sons who brought the vessels to her. Everyone who makes it is going to have their part in making preparation to make it. You're not going to carry anybody into glory with you. She sent her sons out. They went out. They gathered the vessels and brought unto her. Right? And she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. Listen, there's people who's trying to make it on fumes when we will allow the Spirit of the Lord to be poured out in our lives, 
It will be enough to suffice you for today and tomorrow and the next day until the coming of the Lord. Until we are part of those that John saw that hath made herself ready. God help us to find the effort, to find reality in our lives of what's required of us to make it. I want to make it, don't you? I hope the word of God has been a blessing to you today. It was a blessing to me once again.